Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, I appreciate it. Um, so I have been in dogs my whole life. Um, as a kid, I used to, you know, take on all the neighborhood dogs and train them for everybody and teach them tricks and all that good stuff just because I enjoyed it. Um, and I grew up mostly with uh, golden retrievers, but I always wanted a bull mastiff as a kid. And um, my parents were like, no, we're not getting a big dog like that. <laughs> um, so I always knew that one day I would have one. And um, my passion for dogs continued. And then into um, my early 20s, I started my kennel business as far as training and boarding uh, dogs, all breeds. And then in 2004, I purchased my first bull mastiff from a breeder. And kind of it just went crazy from there. You know, you, you can't have just one, I guess. Um, so I started with just a bull mastiff as a pet. Um, and I just loved her, um, loved the breed, really liked the breeder I had been working with. So I got two more from her and started showing and really just kind of became addicted to the whole show world. And uh, I used to always do obedience shows, but I had never done confirmation until the Bull Mastiff. So it was it was a whole new world, but very exciting. And you kind of get like the show bug and then you're hooked. So I traveled a lot at first um, when I first got into the breed, just showing almost every weekend year round. And um, my second Bull Mastiff that I had gotten, we actually um, flew out to Michigan and did our national and we got, um, we made the final cut out of like a hundred and something specials. Um, I had no idea really what I was doing, but the dog was really nice. So <laughs> um, we did really well and it was so much fun. And um, then he ended up not um, being able to be bred, but um, he was just a great, you know, a great way to get into the breed, I guess, for me. And I really was really hooked then as far as in the showing. And I knew that I did want to breed. So at some point, um, and so I purchased another dog from um, a different breeder and she kind of took me under her wing um, and mentored me. And I waited about a year and a half for my show puppy from her and it was uh, a little brindle female and um i flew out to uh illinois to pick her up and showed her myself uh finished her championship myself and um it was just it was amazing and then um you know she after she was two she passed all of her health clearances and um we worked on trying to get her bred, but she ended up being a problematic one. And um, it took about three years. She kept miscarrying. And so it was a lot of heartache. And this breed can be hard um, as far as reproduction and passing all health clearances and stuff. It's It can be pretty heartbreaking, you know, after you invest all the time and emotions and never mind financial stuff. But um, we finally ended up getting her pregnant and she had two puppies. Um, and her son was actually my first bred by champion. So I finished him myself all from the bred by classes and, um, he was amazing. He was like the best family pet, but an amazing show dog as well. Just the best of both worlds. And, um, he uh, he ended up basically being the foundation sire of my bloodline, um, you know, of my breeding program. And uh, I ended up I crossed with a couple other um, breeders bloodlines and kind of intertwined everything to create what I considered the ideal bull mastiff. Um, you know, I like I personally like a bull mastiff that has a little more uh, drive, not quite as much the couch potato. I mean, those are, those are nice. I mean, you know, they just do nothing basically, but um, I, I 
prefer one that likes to be active and um, a little drivier. So, you know, I, but I, those can be difficult as family pets as well, because, you know, they are a big guard breed. And so if they have a high drive, it can be a little problematic for typical pet owners, you know, that just, they just want a dog to love. They don't, they can't, they don't understand and they can't give the mental stimulus that, you know, a big working breed needs if they have a high drive. So I kind of have tried over the years um, to create like um, a bloodline that is the best of both worlds. So, you know, I'll usually have a few that have a higher drive in the litters and I usually end up keeping one of those. And, um, but they also aren't like over the top. So they make great family pets as well. So that's kind of like what I really work towards. And I also, you know, health is really important to me because um, my first two original bull mastiffs didn't, were never bred. And the reason they weren't bred was because they didn't pass health clearances. So, um, you know, that was pretty devastating just getting into the breed. So that's really important to me that the dogs are healthy, that they pass clearances that, you know, over the years I've tried to consistently produce dogs that do pass their clearances where it's not a hit or miss where, you know, you invest all this time and emotions and money into it and then, you know, heartache at the end. So I really, you know, temperament and health are the most important to me. Um, you know, obviously you want the look of a bull mastiff and, and I tend to like more of a, a little bit less, um, overdone, I guess. Like I don't like an overdone uh, bull mastiff. I tend to like a little bit of a longer muzzle. Um, I like wrinkle, but I don't like excessive wrinkle um, because with that comes, you know, infections in the, in the wrinkles on the face and, you know, like a bulldog, they can get yeast and stuff in there. And um, with the shorter muzzles, we also tend to kind of lose uh, a good bite. We tend to lose that nice level or reverse scissor, we end up getting more of a, you know, a bulldog mouth. And um, so for me personally, I tend to like just a, a little more moderate as far as the headpiece goes. Um, I, that's just my, my preference, my ideal, but um, in every litter, you know, you do get some that are a little more bulldoggy versus mastophy and vice versa. Um, so with my guys, I, you know, over the years, I've just, you know, kind of worked towards my goal and I've competed in obedience with some of my bull mastiffs as well. Um, not as much in the last probably 10 years, just because I'm so busy with client dogs, uh, training their dogs. So I have several that have obedience titles and rally titles, and I've also done some weight pull, which is a lot of fun. Um, I haven't done any competition weight pull, but just for fun for the dogs. Um, and then I have a lot of champions. I'm a breeder of merit uh, with the AKC. So in order to do that, you have to have so many champions and so many um, other titles on your dogs and being and have bred for over five years, I think it is. Um, it's been a while, but um, so yeah, that's kind of like a quick overview of you know, my program and me and how I got into it. Um, well, I mean, as soon as I saw them in person and not just in pictures, I mean, I was just, to me, they're just a breathtaking breed. They're very, um, regal looking, very, um, like they just draw you in, at least for me, I'm just drawn to them. They have such a chiseled body and face and features. Um, so that really like, I just, that solidified that I really loved the look of them. And then, you know, meeting them, the other dogs that were at the breeder's house was just, you know, amazing. Um, they were just so sweet. So um, accepting, you know, because their owner was fine and comfortable. So they were accepting of my husband and I, and um so let's see if there was any, I don't know if there was anything really 
I guess the one thing that was, you know, I knew about the breed, I'd heard that, um, you know, that even the the small ones, even puppy, you know, young six month old, you know, you've got to watch out because if they, if they're running and they hit you, you're like, you're going down and you kind of, you know, I knew that that was part of the breed, but you don't really think about it. And I'll tell you, our first one was like, not even six months. She was probably five months, maybe. And she was running around in the yard and, uh, she came barreling behind my husband and caught him right behind the knee. And he flew up into the air, like at least his own height into the air and then landed on his back on the ground, knocked the wind right out of him. And of course I'm laughing because it was just hysterical and caught me off guard, but, uh, he couldn't believe it. And that's a story like that we still tell today. Yeah, I can imagine they're a big, big rough dog if you, especially when they're that young. Yeah. Um, can you, for people who don't quite know what a bull mastiff is or where they come from, can you kind of talk about the history as as you see it and as you know it? Mm -hmm. Sure. So the bull mastiff originated in England, um, and I think like the late eighteen hundreds. 1860s um, was when the like the breed was kind of acknowledged. Um, and what it was, was that the gamekeepers on the estates in England, that their job was to keep the livestock safe. And um, they needed a dog to help them with that because poaching was a huge issue back then on these huge estates. Um, so they tried a few different breeds and it they just didn't work out. They tried um, an English Mastiff because they would guard the estates in general, like around the house itself, um, but they were too slow, um, not enough drive. And then they also tried um, the English Bulldog. Oh, just one second, let me grab it. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so they tried the English Bulldog, which a um, little different than the English Bulldog now. They were definitely, they were used as police dogs back then. So they were pretty aggressive, um, a little over the top, actually. And so they didn't work out because they would actually like maul the uh, poachers when they caught them. And so... They, the gamekeepers played around and ended up crossing the English Mastiff with the English Bulldog. And that is what produced the Bull Mastiff. That's how it came about. And as they fine tuned it, it was, it ended up being a 60 40 uh, ratio. So 60% English Mastiff, 40% English Bulldog. And what they got from that is, you know, today's Bull Mastiff basically, but they were able to track. Um, they're very good trackers and they are really fast in short, like short spurts, um, which is what they needed to do in order to catch a poacher. You know, they would track them through the woods at night and then they would launch at them and uh, like sprint and take them down and basically hold them, pin them until the gamekeeper was able to catch up and take the poacher into custody. So they weren't really meant to bite or, you know, not like um, some of the other guard breeds, which would actually grab, you know, an intruder or poacher, whatever you want to call them, um, and hold them with their mouth or, or maul them a little bit. The bull mastiff tended not to do that. They just would pin them, they'd lay on them, you know, very rarely did they actually mouth them. And so they would hold them down until the poachers got there. I mean, sorry, until the gamekeeper got there. And then the Poachers typically back in the 1800s were hung if they were caught. So, you know, during all that, a lot of times, you know, the dogs would get injured as well, but they were very good at tracking them down. And the brindles were kind of the ideal back then because in the woods at night, you, you can't see a brindle. So you can't see them coming. Um, and they say that, you know, the gamekeeper would have like they'd have cottages, little cabins in the woods where they lived. 
and they would sit out there in the evenings and during the night on their watch with the bull mastiff kind of just sitting next to them. And they'd have like their hand on the bull mastiff's head on the top of their head with like their fingers down between the eyes. And so the reason we don't want them, you know, originally too wrinkly is because they shouldn't be have a wrinkled forehead when they're not alert. But when they're alert, the ears go forward and everything wrinkles. And so the gamekeeper would feel that on his fingertips and he would know that the dog was onto something. And so that's kind of why, you know, the bull massive shouldn't be excessively wrinkled all the time, only when they're alert. Um, that was the whole point of that was actually so that the gamekeeper didn't have to see because it was dark out. Um, they could feel when the dog went on to something. So it's pretty cool. It's a pretty neat, um, the way that, you know, they developed the breed, at least in my opinion, it's pretty cool how they crossed the two and really, you know, got like figured out the perfect ratio to get the temperament they wanted. To this day, I, I like, uh, that, that idea of composite breeds. I know that's a heresy <laughs> in, the, <laughs> in, in, in a lot of the AKC world, but uh, I think, when you do take a risk, you, you end up with really cool dogs like the Bo Mastiff, right? So. Yep. <clears throat> Can you talk about the uh, AKC standards um, and how, uh, if there's a difference between what you see in the AKC world and say the FCI world? So our standards are actually pretty similar. Um, I would say you don't really see a huge variation between like American dogs, AKC, and then the dogs that are overseas. Um, it's more, they're pretty similar. Um, but I would say the biggest variation you see is between breeders, like between bloodlines, like what certain breeders um, like and their preferences, I would say that's where you see the biggest differences in the breed. And, you know, there's in that same thing, there's judges that like certain types as well. Um, but so our standard for basically is we want um, a very square dog. So how they refer to it is like a cube on a cube on a cube, meaning um, a square muzzle on a square head, on a square body. Um, so as close to that as possible. And when you have a super square dog in the body, you don't have, um, you don't get like huge movement like some of the working breeds have, um, like in the show ring, because you can't, when they're that short back, they have, you know, they don't have enough room to stride out. So there's quite a variation in the length of back that you see nowadays, because in the AKC world, in order to be competitive in like the group ring, you need a longer back dog so that they can move out typically um, to be able to be competitive against like Dobermans and Rottweilers and things like that, that can really move. Um, so ideal square dog. And for females, we like to see, um, about 24 inches tall is on the low end. Um, so 24 to 26 would be max for a female um, at the shoulders. And weight is anywhere from about 90-ish pounds, a little over 90 pounds to about 115. Occasionally you'll have a top, tip top of the standard female who's more like 120s. But I would say that's more rare and it definitely shouldn't be like bred for. You don't want females that big. Um, your males, we want somewhere between 25 and 27 inches at the shoulder. Um, and the weight in our standard is for males is 125, 120-ish to 135, maybe 140, which in my personal opinion, I think should be a little, should be adjusted a little bit because a 27 inch dog um, at the shoulder that only weighs 125 pounds is going to be a little light, going to be a little scrawny, uh, not a lot of bone because um, their bone, obviously when they're heavy boned is makes up a lot of their weight. 
Um, I would say that we see, in my opinion, more more height in the U.S. versus overseas. I would say that's a bigger difference is the height of the dogs. Um, there's definitely a more variation over here, and we do have some taller dogs occasionally. Um, let's see. We want uh, in the standard it calls for moderate angles, front and rear. Um, so the shoulder lay back and the rear angle, so the bend of the stifle down into the hock, we want moderate. And so if you look back at the original bull mastiff, they actually were kind of straight in the rear, which would be, I guess, considered more moderate for them. Um, and now we see a big variation. We have very straight stifles, and then we also have over-angulated stifles. Um, within the breed. So there's a lot of variation there and finding the happy medium is, can, can be difficult <laughs> trying to, you know, match up the right pairs in order to try to get that moderate versus um, over angulated or straight. So when <clears throat> I asked that question, cause then I followed it up with, um, what is your ideal bull mastiff? So what are you looking for within the standard to create and what you think makes the best dog as far as confirmation um, and then also uh, temperament? And, and how does that fit in with, with the, uh, the standards that you're trying to live by? Um, so I, my ideal would be... Um, you know, as far as for females, I like about a hundred pound female, um, maybe 105, but I tend to breed, my females are typically right around a hundred pounds. 105 is, you know, probably pretty much the max I have produced bigger, but that's not my ideal. Um, I do like a very square dog. I really like a short back. So very square. Um, I like the, you know, I like the idea of the cube on the cube as far as the muzzle on the head. But for me, in order to have like a cube muzzle, it has to be fairly short. And that's just my, you know, interpretation of it. Um, so I would rather have a little bit longer muzzle so that it's not excessive. Um, but it still gives the appearance of a square, just not quite as cubey, I guess, as some people would want. Um, I do like a lot of bone, not like to the point where the dog can't move and they're cumbersome, you know, kind of like the English Mastiff can be so much bone that they, you know, that's why they're slow. And, but I do like a decent amount of bone. I don't want like a scrawny legged bull Mastiff um, because I think that takes away from like that overall just very regal and royal looking appearance that they give and that, you know, tightness. I tend to, I like, I don't like a dog with a ton of extra skin, which we definitely can get within our breed. Um, so I like more of a tight, what I would call a tight dog or a clean dog, meaning like their throat doesn't have all this excess jowls and and kind of like gizzard things hanging down under their chin. And um, I don't really care for a ton of wrinkle over the shoulders. I like a nice clean like neck down into the back. Um, for males, I, for me, I definitely want the male to look like a male. Um, I want it to be masculine. I don't want to have to look underneath to see if it has undercarriage or not. Um, if I have a if there's a dog and I'm like, wow, it's a beautiful dog. And I'm thinking in my head, you know, it's, it's definitely got to be a girl. And then it's a boy. I'm like, mm, you shouldn't mistake it. Like females should be feminine and males should be masculine. And you shouldn't have to guess as to what they are when you see them. So my ideal male is 125 pounds. Like at the lightest. I prefer anywhere from 125 to 135. Um, now I've had some boys that I've had that did really well, you know, finish their championships and stuff that were 120, but I really like a little bit of a bigger male personally. 
Um, I think, you know, the biggest difference is, is um, size. And I think, you know, the U.S. just has a little bigger variation where the ones that I've seen from overseas are, um, I guess, more consistent. Um, definitely very square. Um, they tend to, they do tend to have good bone from what I've seen. And, you know, I haven't traveled over to see a ton of the breeders over there. I've, you know, I see a lot of pictures, but sometimes pictures can be deceiving. Um, and I typically at the national, we have people that come, you know, bring their dogs from overseas, um, to show. Um, I would say that I think it's just less of a variation over there than it is in the U S. What part of the, what part of the world do you uh, think is, is breeding some of the best bull mastiff these days? Oh boy. I guess I, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, I have imported a couple dogs over the years that, you know, um, had really nice bloodlines, but the bloodlines mostly come from the U.S., you know, like now. Like, so if you go and you look overseas to buy a dog, you look back in the pedigree and most of them come back to the U.S. dogs. Um, I would say that I don't see enough of what's produced over there in person to say whether or not you know, they're superior to what's being bred over here. I think there's really nice dogs being produced everywhere. It just depends on your style um, and what your preference is for the standard, what you think is your ideal. But, um, you know, I just, I think that's a really hard question, I guess. I don't know if I can answer that, you know, uh, with actually like a knowledge base to back it. Is there a difference in uh, temperament, have you heard, between uh, the European and American lines? Um, the, one, the, the dogs that I have personally met from overseas um, all had great temperaments. Um, but again, I haven't met enough of them to compare to the amount of dogs in the U.S. that I've met, the different bloodlines and the temperaments. Um, so I would say what we have in for the American dogs is that, you know, as breeders, we definitely know that there's certain lines that tend to be a little, um, softer. So maybe a little, a little more skittish. They're not as brave. And obviously in our standard state, you know, you shouldn't have a bull massive that cowards down. Um, they shouldn't be outwardly aggressive, but they shouldn't be a coward either. And so I would say there's a big variation there in the U.S. that I've seen where either A, they're really soft or B, they're a little, they're too edgy. And, um, you know, there's a lot of talk amongst different breeders about like, well, this line has that and this line has that. And, you know, I, I try to stay away out of that. You know, I've bred, um, I've been very selective on what I've bred to as far as bloodlines go. And I have, you know, outcrossed a few times to lines that I haven't used before. And typically I keep going back to the lines that I originally started with because I like the consistency and temperament that I'm getting versus like having it kind of be like, well, a few of the puppies are really skittish. And then a few of the puppies really could care less what you want and they don't want to work. They don't want to listen at all. You know, they tend to be a little too edgy, um, which in the wrong hands can be dangerous with a working breed. So at, when I first started showing, I went with the breeder that I got my first one from, my first three actually from. And um, so she was super, super nice. Um, and she kind of just introduced me to everybody and told me, you know, uh, you know, her, in her opinion, you know, the breakdown of different people and their dogs and what she knew about their lines and as far as health wise and temperament wise. And so it was kind of a lot of information and I was just taking it all in. Um, I did a lot of like watching 
Um, I tend to be a visual learner. So I would just sit all day at the dog shows when I was there and just watch, watch handlers of all breeds, owners, breeders, and just kind of observe. And I think it's like, it's that like adrenaline that gets you hooked as in with any sport. If you're a competitive person, if you're not a competitive person, probably you wouldn't care to show. Um, but I am a competitive person. So it's that like, Ooh, am I, you know, the judge is going down the lineup. They're looking like you think they like you that you think they like their, you know, your dog. So you're really working it. Um, and that was really what got me hooked was just like, how much can I work with my dogs to make them like perfect in the ring as far as gating and free stacking and giving expression to the judge to keep drawing the judge to keep looking at them. I mean, you have to have a dog that wants to show that wants to be the center of attention versus a dog that doesn't really care about strangers, doesn't really want to affiliate with them. Because if you don't, then the dog is just like, you know, doesn't want to be there and the judge won't look at it. Even if it's the most perfect specimen, even if it should win, if we're judging on the standard, because our standard does state that bull mastiffs, uh, and honestly, in my opinion, any working breed should not allow a stranger to just walk up and get in their business and open their mouth and shove their face down in there to look at their teeth and grab their back end. And, you know, we've bred that out of them. You know, I mean, any real working breed in their standard, if you read most of them, state that they, you know, they should be aloof to strangers and bull mastiffs are no exception in our standard, you know, they should be aloof. They should be indifferent to strangers, um, accepting if their owners are fine, but like could care less to fraternize with them. So that part of the showing is, is kind of frustrating sometimes. Um, I used to try to show all of the dogs that I bred and I, have quite a few of my best, in my opinion, my best um, that I've bred that couldn't show. And it's not that they couldn't, they hated it because they didn't, they just could care less about all of the to do about the strangers, about people going, touching them and getting up in their business. They were like, mm, I don't want any of this. You know, they weren't aggressive, but they didn't enjoy it at all. And so over the years, in the last 20 years, I've learned that it's just, it's not worth it. I want my dogs to do what they enjoy. And if that means laying on my couch all day, then that's what they do. And if they like to show, then I'm all about showing them. But I don't force it anymore. Um, because over the years, I've seen, you know, a lot of the other kind of the ugly side of AKC shows. Um, and what I'd like to see change is that it's not be so political. Like if you don't have tons of money to advertise in the dog show catalogs that are given to the judges, um, it shouldn't mean that you don't ever win. And the top dogs that you keep seeing win over and over and over again, if you were to get a copy of those catalogs um, that come out every month, and there's multiples of them. Those top winning dogs have ads in there, full ads with pictures. So the judges know the dog and they, they can recognize it. And they also recognize the handler. So there's a political side that makes it not inviting and not fun for new people or people that want to show their own dogs. Um, you know, the AKC has in the last several years, you know, tried to, make it more um, breeder friendly, breeder owner friendly. So they have like the bred by classes and you get kind of special recognition if you finish your dog from a bred by. Um, and they have the national owner, owner handler series now. So if you show your own dog, you can compete in that, which is nice, but it doesn't change that neither one of those, if you do really well in just bred by classes or just national owner handler series, they don't give you any points. You still would have to win against the handlers. Um, so it's, 
that I think that's the biggest thing I wish would change is that new people would be more accepted. And, you know, when you first get into a breed, you have to, it's a learning curve. You know, you have to figure out what your ideal is for your breed. And it might not be what everybody else's ideal is because we all interpret the standard different. Um, And so you see a lot of people be very mean and very, they, they talk down to these new people with their dogs because they're like, that's a pet, you know, it has no business being here. You should have gone to a better breeder. And that basically, um, gives everybody a bad taste in their mouth. So I think it's the, one of the main reasons that our, you know, at the dog shows in all breeds, really, that our numbers are down. There's not as many people because a lot of new people don't want to go. And so a lot of the new breeders we find, they, they aren't showing their dogs. And then you have, you know, the older longtime breeders saying, well, these people don't do anything with their dogs. But, and there, is, there are some that don't do anything with their dogs and they're breeding them. But in their defense, sometimes they're not doing anything because the longtime breeders are mean and they don't want to help them. Like everybody has to start somewhere and no breeder is going to sell a person just getting into a breed the best puppy that they've ever produced. They're not going to do that. You have to earn that, you know, by being in the breed. So when you start out, you got to have other people be accepting of your maybe mediocre dog because everybody has to start somewhere and all you can do is go up, right? I mean, you breed to better the breed and to improve your line. So I think that's the biggest thing I wish would change is the camaraderie at shows would be better and not even just not at shows, but just in general, in the breeding world, I wish that breeders would be nicer to each other. Um, let me just say one more thing about the whole show thing. Let me touch on that. Um, it kind of listening, you know, to what you were saying made me think of another difference of like a lot of the shows over in Europe. Um, they're not, they're not as, I don't even know as they're not as like, uh, the rich man's game, I guess. It's like, you see them showing over there and, They don't have these fancy suits on and, you know, because it's ultimately it's being judged on the dog versus the handler. And um, I do like that because I feel like not everybody first off can afford all these expensive suits that, I mean, my dogs are just going to slobber all over (laughs) and ruin. Um, And again, you know, why do we need to, be dressed to the hilt if they're judging only the dog. So I, I do think that that's a big difference in the show world. And it's one of the reasons that I also started showing you Casey um, over here was because it um, was just more fun. And, you know, people were a lot nicer, inviting, um, I I mean, I dressed nicely when I show in UKC, like out of respect, you know, I'm not going to come in dirty ripped clothes, but I could, I felt comfortable like showing in a nice pair of jeans, my sneakers, and I would put a little blazer on, you know, with a nice shirt underneath. And um, it just was really fun. And I really, when I meet new people trying to get into the shows, I always recommend that they start with you, Casey, to build their confidence um, so that they don't get that negative kind of feel. So I just wanted to add that in real quick. But um, And is it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and a caveat with you, Casey, is that you you have to be the owner of that correct. dog, correct? Or at least part owner. Yeah. I think that, I think that, I know that's another thing that would, is heresy to talk about as far as the AKC world, because I know people make their livings Mm -hmm. showing the dogs, but um, I don't know. Maybe that adds to a little bit of the, the exclusivity of it uh, that you could pay a professional handler that has a name and is probably on 
on the path of becoming a judge themselves, you know, just came kind of feels a little icky to me. Yes. And so, so yeah, I've always kind of liked that idea of what the UKC is doing and, and what you said about, I've actually asked this with, uh, to people, uh, recently, um, uh, because it's another thing that for, for an out like an outsider like me, it's looking in, I, I want no part of wearing a suit. It just adds to the stuffiness mm -hmm. for me. And, it, it and granted, I am pretty much anti elitist. I am pro working man all the way, and so it. Just, so I am definitely biased yeah. on that level. But I, I ask, you know, I talk about that. It's like just takes away from the, to me, the the overall like essence of what dogs used to be and what what the AKC was mm -hmm. originated out of it was a working man's game, you know, and and if that meant that you didn't have a thousand dollar pair of penny loafers on you, you still were judged by the merit of your dog, not by the merit of your dress. Yeah. And, and I see some of these AKC show type, uh, pages and channels and, and then they got things like the fashion of the AKC <laughs> or something like that. I'm like, uh. but so, but I don't want to disrespect you know, because I know you have to play the game. Well, I mean, in, in no, I totally understand. Um, and there's been times throughout the years that I've taken breaks from competing in AKC events because, you know, there were certain instances where something just set me over the edge and I was like, you know what? No, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Um, and again, one of the reasons I love the UKC is that it's not – um, it's not a fashion show with the dogs either. Like it's not about being pretty because, you know, I mean, I think bull mastiffs are pretty, I guess, if you want to call it pretty. Right. I mean, but, um, I think they're beautiful and I, but when, you know, you think of a working breed, a guard dog, I don't think of them being this, like, I don't know walking around with like a coat on when it's raining and booties that they put on to go out to potty their dog at the show. And I'm like, what? No, like, no. <laughs> so the UKC promotes not just beauty, but brains. So the, they want to see the dog with titles on both ends of their name. So not just the champion for looks, if that's what you want to call it, but also workability. Can the dog actually do what the breed is supposed to be able to do as close to it as we can come to simulating that? And the UKC recognizes, like they encourage and recognize breeders that try to have nice looking dogs, but also dogs that can do their job. You know, I, if I'm using my own males, um, I do try to, I try to teach, I guess, or help, uh, you know, my males learn how to do a natural tie, um, a natural breeding. Some of them are just too lazy. Um, and then of course you have some females that are just too dominant and they won't allow it. So I'll do an AI. Um, most like when you breed to another breeder's dogs, it's very rare with show breeders that they'll let their dogs do a natural at any point. They just won't allow it. Um, again, kind of, I think part of that, oh, well, they might get hurt and they might injure themselves. And, and yes, I mean, but they can injure themselves running out in the backyard after a ball. So, <laughs> um, so I do like to try to do, um, you know, let, let them actually facilitate and, and do a natural tie if possible. Obviously I monitor all that. I'm there. I don't allow just put two dogs out together because they are a big dog and they could hurt each other. But, um, so I will say that I have found with certain, uh, lines of my own, like certain female lines, um, historically won't get pregnant if you do an AI, even though they say, you know, a repo specialist will say an AI is, you know, no different than a natural, but it is because I have girls that will not take with an AI, but on the next cycle, I'll do a natural with that same boy and they get pregnant. Um, 
so there can be some fertility hoops to jump through. Um, so if you're breeding to a dog that can't do a natural tie, then you got to do a surgical insemination, which is very expensive. Um, not just like for the procedure itself, but also for um, all the progesterone you need to do to know when to do the insemination. Um, as far as whelping goes, um, some some breeders, a lot of times newer breeders just getting into it will let their girls free whelp. Um, I did try it when I was new too, because I was like, oh, I'm gonna show everybody that they can free whelp and, and I wish that they could. Um, but I learned that it's just occasionally you might have a successful free whelp, but very rarely will the mother actually get all the puppies out. Um, sometimes none. So they are prone to uterine inertia, which is a bully problem. Um, uh, most bully breeds are prone to uterine inertia, which basically the uterus just quits and it's like, mm, it's not strong enough. You know, the contractions just don't push the puppies out. But, um, so I typically do a scheduled C-section for my girls. So because I pull progesterone, I know when they ovulate and I know exactly when to C-section. So I typically take them in like <clears throat> the day before they'd go into labor, theoretically, naturally. So that way I don't have to deal with that. And, um, being good mothers, well, it depends, <laughs> Um, sometimes first, like if I find that, um, if I have a sharper temperament girl, like she's just, you know, just a little bit sharper, a little edgier, the best thing I can do for her is to let her have at least, or at least attempt to have one puppy naturally and then take her in for a C-section. Um, because if you just, I find, I found in the past, if you just C-section them for their first litter they will not accept the puppies. They will be aggressive with them because, you know, they have no idea what happened. They just wake up and these little squeaky mice are on them, you know, and they're like, well, I don't know what that is, but I'll eat that. So um, I, I know my line pretty well now um, from, you know, over the years, keeping track of which damn lines are good mothers, which ones need to have a puppy naturally. And those edgy moms are normally my best mothers, but you got to give them the chance to actually understand that it came from them for them to that maternal instinct to kick in. Um, I will say that I think I've been lucky with my girls um, as, you know, other than, you know, C-sectioning, you know, a couple of times throughout the years with girls that were, should have had at least one naturally and them not wanting them. Other than that, my girls have been really, really good moms, in my opinion, for the breed. So with that being said, they cannot stay with them unattended. So they can't be in the whelping box with them when you're not there because they think they're lap dogs. So they'll literally sit on and lay on their puppies and the puppies will be screaming and they'll just be sitting there like, I don't know what that noise is, but someone better quiet it. You know, not a clue that they're sitting on it. Um, so it's, it's almost comical. It's like, really you guys? So I don't leave them in with them. Um, I get up every three to four hours right after they're born. Um, I used to get up every two hours around the clock and learned very quickly that that will burn you out and that they really don't need to eat that much. Um, so now I do every three to four and I've been pretty lucky with my mom's having milk. I will say, I think because they can't stay with them 24 seven, they don't get the milk supply that um, a bitch that can stay with their puppies all the time gets. They, I mean, you know, supply and demand. So they don't have as much demand. Um, so I typically always bottle feed as well. So I let the puppies nurse. Um, I would say 75% of my mothers will clean their puppies. And, the, and then there's 25% that are like, yeah, I'm not licking that. <laughs> so then I have to do that, you know, wipe their bottoms and stimulate them. But I typically let them nurse, potty them, and then I offer them a bottle and then put them back in the whelping box. Um, and I don't really mind that. I know a lot of breeder friends of mine that breed other breeds and they're like, oh, I don't know how you do it. And I'm like, 
I don't really mind bottle feeding, honestly. I'm, I think just all these years of doing it, I can bottle feed like four puppies at once. I mean, I've got it down half asleep, you know, I got it down, but, um, you know, I, I enjoy that time with them because it gives me a lot of bonding time with each individual puppy to be bottle feeding every feeding, um, after they're done nursing on their mom. And, you know, when the puppies get, start getting teeth, I will say that bull mastiffs, most of the time, probably 90% of them are like, okay, I'm done. We are weaning. And they just, they don't want to lay down. They lay down for literally five minutes and then they jump up. And, you know, I've tried wrestling them and holding them down and it's just not happening. Um, so usually two and a half weeks old, I'm, I'm starting the weaning process because the mothers are not having it. And, um, so I typically start like a mash with just like baby rice cereal and formula at like two and a half weeks. And by three weeks they're on food. And if the mother wants to nurse, then I, I still let her, but typically my girls are done by three weeks, like done, done. So talk about what health testing uh, means to your program sure. and uh, um, as a preservation. Group. So I do um, cardio, so hearts, um, eyes, and then I do hips and elbows and I do the genetic panels that they offer now. Um, so in bull mastiffs, you know, SAS is a basically a huge heart problem that they have. And, but, you know, if you have them screened by a cardiologist at, after they're a year of age, um, and especially if you do an echo, you know, that you're going to find it if they have it. So it's a good way to just make sure that that's not in your line. Um, and hearts are a big thing for me. Like if the dog has a heart condition, I mean, that's like pretty bad. Like, it's not like people where they do a heart transplant and stuff. So that is definitely a really important one for me. Um, and my first two bull mastiffs that failed their health clearances, it was their hearts and, um, and they didn't live full lives because of it. So hearts are a big, I'm a stickler for having heart certifications done. Um, the eyes, you know, I think for me, typically bull mastiffs, the only eye thing they're really looking for is entropian. Um, and ultimately it's a bully breed. So they are hit or miss. I mean, I warn everybody, if you're getting a bully breed, they might, for bull mastiffs, they're gonna, they don't have cherry eye issues, but a lot of times they get entropian. It is what it is. Um, so that being said, I, you know, I would hope that if you're breeding, you know what entropian looks like. I mean, the dog's eye swells, up, you know, they get a, they get um, an ulcer, but, I still do it, um, even though, I mean, because I figure ev eventually at some point, probably when they're bred enough, we'll have another eye issue that comes up that it will be screened by that. Um, and then I really like pen hip over OFA. OFA is kind of in bed with the AKC, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, I find that they... OFA is more someone's opinion versus a scientific evidence, like a measurement. Um, pen hip is a measurement. Um, it's not someone just saying, well, I think your dog's hips are no good, or I think they're fine. Um, so I, I prefer pen hip, but I also will, I do OFA elbows anyway, because no one else offers elbow certification. So I typically will certify my dog's hips as well through OFA, but I put a lot more weight on pen hip results um, for my dogs personally. And I recommend it to everybody. Um, the other thing is you can do pen hip when they're four months old and that's a final certification. So it helps breeders. Like if a breeder's having a hip issue in their line or they're trying to get into breeding and their first few dogs keep failing hips, after two, you know, you wait two years, that's a long time where with pen hip, you can check them at four months. So if they aren't going to pass for what you want in your program, then you can 
get them into a really great pet home while they're still young, which I think is important. Um, so those are that those ones that I do. And then the genetic panels, um, I think are really important. I think a lot of breeders, some of the old time breeders are just now starting that I'm seeing in bull massives to get on board with it. And I don't know why it's taken so long. Um, it's really cheap in all of all the health testing, the genetic testing is pretty cheap. Um, you can do it when they're a week old and it tests for, depending on, you know, what company you're using anywhere from like 10 to 150 genetic disorders, they might not all apply to your breed right now, but maybe in the future they would, and you'd have that on record. Um, but it tells you what, you know, recessive, if they're clear or if they're carrying something, it just helps you make a, you know, a smarter breeding decision. So I, I really recommend genetic testing to most people if I'm mentoring them in any breed. What, what does health testing mean to you? Um, because this is a, I know that's kind of a convoluted question, but what I'm getting at is, is it a guide or is it gospel? Um, is it, is it black and white or is there gray? It's area? definitely not black and white, at least not for me. Um, and my mentors in the breed that, um, you know, have been gone for years now, you know, have passed away years ago, you know, so they were in the breed a long, long time ago. And they always said, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So you have to look at the dog in front of you. Um, and you know, know what their pedigree is and kind of look back at that. And then, you know, you have to make an educated decision. So what I kind of, you know, just because, so say if a dog passes, um, everything, but fails an elbow, um, to me, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, a, because if a dog fails one elbow, the other one's fine and the hips are fine. It's a joint, right? So typically, like in people, right? If someone has a joint issue, it's typically like joints in their body. Like they'll have a hip replacement. They got to have a knee replacement. And the other hip goes like it tends to be like a genetic thing, meaning there's a discrepancy in the chromosomes that causes all joints to deteriorate. Um, so for me, like one elbow is a red flag that that probably was an injury because if a puppy gets injured before the actual joint is formed, um, you know, because cartilage holds it together for like the first six months. So if they get an injury, there's a good chance that that joint specifically, just that one won't pass. Um, doesn't mean that it's dysplasia. And that's another thing that I don't like about OFA is that it's pass or fail and they have dysplasia or they don't have dysplasia. But ultimately, I don't think that they, it's possible to have dysplasia in one joint and not have other joints that are at least iffy. Um, and a lot of people would argue me on that and that's fine. That's my, it's my personal opinion. Um, so the one thing I'm a stickler on is hearts. I, I won't mess around with that because it's an echocardiogram. It's, you know, it's a cardiologist, like it's not really someone's opinion. It's literally, they measure the velocity of the heart, the blood, the pressure going through the valves. Um, to me, that's, that's pretty hundred percent. So that I won't mess with because we don't even really know how hearts are passed, like genetic defects in the heart. Are they a recessive? Are they a polygenetic? Um, we don't know 100% how they're passed, so I won't mess with that. Hips and elbows are a polygenetic, and so they just kind of pop up here and there throughout a pedigree. It doesn't have a rhyme or reason. You can have two dogs that have excellent everything and the whole litter fails. Um, and I've had that happen. So <laughs> for people who say that doesn't happen, it absolutely does. I had a bitch that was excellent hips, OFA, pen hipped in the top percentile, good elbows, 
past her heart, eyes, everything. I bred her to a male that also was pen hipped, OFA excellent. And I kept four of the puppies and all four basically had zero hip sockets. No symptoms, but I did pen hip on them at four months. And I was like, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then I kept a couple and at a, at a year old re x-rayed and they literally just had no hip sockets. So I, I think health testing is, it's definitely not a black and white. I think it's important to do it for your own knowledge. And if I have a dog that fails an elbow, let's say, or like with pen hip, they rate each hip separately because it's a measurement. It's not an overall like, okay, well, one hip looks bad. So we're going to fail the whole thing. So I like that because I can say, well, you know, the right hip when they, and typically if I have a dog that fails one side, not the other, usually that dog as a young dog had an injury where they limped on that side. And I, you know, you don't think anything of it when it happens, but um, typically that's what I've found. So I, um, I, I play around in the gray area, <laughs> but I guarantee, I guarantee my puppies regardless you know, the same health guarantee. So I'm standing behind my decision. For me, um, when I, you know, it's, I'm super, I, I find, you know, I want um, my pet people to have the best experience with me <clears throat> because I'm an obedient, I'm a trainer and I'm a behaviorist. So I see the worst of the worst dogs. Um, I don't ever want another trainer to have one of my dogs come in <laughs> to their training program and be like, what was that breeder thinking when they gave you this puppy? So I am very regimented and strict about how, like, I don't let people come in and choose their puppy. Nobody chooses their puppy. Um, I do a formal health test, uh, sorry, formal temperament test. At seven weeks of age, I use the Valhard <clears throat> temperament test, which is from Germany. Um, I have tweaked it to fit the Bull Mastiff because it was kind of geared towards a higher drive dog. Um, and I also add in some of the testing, the temperament testing that's done for like service dogs and therapy dogs. And so it's very accurate if it's done within a day or two of seven weeks. And so I do that. And then I figure out their scoring, you know, take into consideration everything during the test, take notes on it, write my interpretation of the results. Um, and then I have everybody that's getting a puppy from the litter, even though I have their application and we did their interview, I have another form that I send them. It's, it's called the get to know me better form. It basically just gets more in depth, like how many little, you know, do you have little animals? Do you have like rodents? Do you, you know, farm animals, um, their lifestyles, more in depth of that kind of stuff. And so then I can match the right temperament accordingly to them. So that's how I do like people who are getting uh, just a pet um, for what I'm going to keep for myself. And um if I do have any that are going show potential breeding, I don't sell to many other breeders. I don't sell with full rights very often. Um, I just, I would rather keep what I want to perpetuate in the breed. Um, just from my own personal experience, it's not necessarily fun to deal with other breeders as far as them having your dogs. So um, for me, I have right around seven to seven and a half weeks. I do structure evaluations as well. And I usually have a few of my breeder friends that breed other breeds. I try to, we use each other to evaluate our litters because we don't have that personal connection because it's not our breed. So we tend to be more like we see things that we might be blind to if it was a breed that we loved, like that we were into and were invested into. So um, we get together and, you know, have a girl's day and we evaluate each other's litter. So it's fun. Um, and it helps you see 
a different side of your dogs, a different side of your puppies, like, because it's different eyes and they interpret things different. So I think it's a really good way to learn more about structure because structure is structure, whatever breed it is. Um, you just have to understand what that breed structure should be, but, um, a good rear and, you know, good hawks and stifles are the same across the board if they're good. Um, so that's how I pick my show puppies or breeding, you know, puppies. So what I'm looking for is just as close to the breeds to, as my ideal, um, as far as structure goes and, you know, how their bite looks at this at seven to eight weeks old. Um, and then I also take into consideration how they scored on their temperament test. So for me, occasionally I'll keep a shy one and just know that I, you know, it won't want to show, which is fine. Um, but I also find that you have to be careful because if you have timid, timidness is definitely, it can definitely be genetic. And so you have to just be smart about how you match that dog up to other dogs in the breeding program down the road. Um, so as long as you take into that into account, you know, temperament, you can be a little bit different on. Obviously, I would never want to breed a dog that had an unstable temperament as far as like aggression or anything like that. But I also wouldn't, I wouldn't send that to a pet home either. So, um, you know, that's what nobody wants to talk about is what happens if that happens. But um, it's really important to me that everyone gets the right puppy for them, because I don't want I don't want heartache for them down the road when they realize that they can't give this dog what it needs. Um, and it's not fun. It's a hassle. And I don't, it's not fair to my puppy to put them into that situation either. So I really, temperament is the biggest thing, personality and matching it. And it's kind of fun. I, I enjoy doing that, matching the families to the puppies. And I give them a copy of the temperament test and it's pretty cool because they'll message me like two or three years later. And they're like, seriously, the explanation of this dog is exactly what they ended up being. But sometimes you don't see it as a puppy. It's once they're older that you see it come out. So it's kind of cool. I've always loved shepherds as well. And, you know, growing up, I rescued a couple here and there. So they've always been a breed that I've pretty much always had a shepherd my entire life. Um, I, I don't breed them as much as I do my bull mastiffs because I mean, we all have that breed that is just like our heart and soul. And that is definitely my bullies. Um, but I love the protection aspect of the shepherd, even though, I mean, most of my bull mastiffs would take anybody out if they were trying to touch me or my family. But the shepherds definitely, you know, they come out with the guns aimed and ready, loaded, um, where the bullies will kind of stand back and wait and decide if they need to take over. But um, I like how active the shepherds are, where the bullies aren't as active as that. Um, and they honestly, they offset each other really well. So, you know, you've got your high strung, crazy shepherd over here, and then you've got your like hum de hum, you know, bull mastiff here. And so they really kind of counteract each other. Um, they're really a great pair like to match up to play with um, as far as like their playmates because bull mastiffs are tough. Like, I mean, most bullies are any bully breed. They're, they're tough. They've got tough skin. Like my vet says they have cowhide, like nothing penetrates that. Um, and, and they're, they just, their pain tolerance is unbelievably high. So shepherds are squeamish, like if you hurt them, but they also play really rough and they, with their mouth and their teeth. So a lot of breeds can't play with shepherds because they end up ripping them apart, not really meaning to, but they always grab with their mouth and bull mastiffs just have that skin. Like it doesn't rip it. And if, the shepherd bites them and hurts them, the bully will just pin them, take them out. And so they really just offset each other really well. Um, and it gives me the best of both worlds. Like I have my, 
you know, a squishy bull mastiff that just wants to cuddle and hang with me. And then, but if I want to go out and do some intense obedience training or, you know, go shed hunting or something that requires a dog that can go longer and faster, um, then I have the shepherd. So it's, it's really, I don't know. They've just always been like the two breeds that I really love. Um, now I love goldens cause I grew up with them and I work with a ton of goldens. Uh, I work with a lot of golden breeders. Um, they're just not for me. Since you do have a lot of experience with training and, and dealing with all different kinds of dogs, what one breed of dog that you've never really, um, had a lot of experience handling. And of course you haven't owned that interests you and why? Um, Hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. So I've worked with so many different breeds, like training wise, I've done a ton of rescue, but I would say the one breed that I would probably, if I didn't have bullies, if I didn't have bull mastiffs, I would probably want, um, like an Amstaff or a pity um something along those lines i would definitely be all about that you know a little a little more portable than the bull mastiff um but still like that tight hard body the very regal loyal looking it's there's something about that look that i really really like um you know, like I love bulldogs. They are so stinking cute. And I have a couple clients that I've worked with over the years that have them, but I don't like the excess skin. I like a tighter dog, like tighter skin. Um, so I would say probably like somewhere the am staff or, you know, the pity. Um, there's a couple others. There's another one. I can't remember the name of it. It's a small, it basically is a small version of the am staff. Staff yes. Terrible Terrier. Yep. Yeah. yeah, just the they're kind of shorter. Typically yeah. 25 to 35 yep. pounds. Yeah, and shorter. Yeah. Big yep. big head. Yeah. Ter so I body. think those it would probably be between that if I that I would really I would love to own, but I just can't the bull mm -hmm. mastiffs, in my opinion, would not get along with them. <laughs> 